Today I want to show you a science-based practice strategy called variable practice that completely changed my playing. I'm going to explain exactly what it is. I want to share some interesting research that I found on it. And I'm also going to show you how you can apply it to your practice so that your hard work and improvements can stick long term instead of disappearing by the end of the week. My name is Diego Alonso and I've been a professional classical and flamenco guitarist for over 20 years and I've taught over 20,000 lessons. And during that time, one of the biggest problems I've seen students face has been to try to perfect their playing by repeating the same thing in the same way over and over. Now, this is exactly what I did because, I mean, it kind of makes sense to do that, right? I mean, if we repeat a phrase of music over and over in the same way that we want to perform it, then it makes intuitive sense that this strategy should help us perform that phrase the same way we practiced it, right? But according to research and quite a bit of it, and I guess for what it's worth my own experience, it actually doesn't work that way. A more effective way to get your music to sound the way you want is to deliberately add some variation to the way that you execute your repetition. So for example, maybe repetition one, you play it um, kind of quietly. Repetition two could be maybe a little bit louder. Repetition three could be really loud, etc. You can also, you can vary your tone, you can vary your tempo, and a whole bunch of other things that we'll talk about in a minute. One of the most famous studies on variable practice was a study done by researchers Kerr and Booth in 1978 in a paper that was called Specific and Varied Practice of Motor Skills. Now, this study has been cited a million times at this point, and the researchers, what they did was they had two groups of kids throwing bean bags into, into a target at various distances. One group of kids was the specific practice group, and they engaged in constant practice. They were, they were given just one target at three feet away. And the whole time they were told just to practice throwing the bean bags into the three foot target only. The second group was the, what's what they called the schema group. And they, they engaged in variable practice and they were given two targets. They were given a two foot target and then a four foot target. Now they were not given a three foot target like the constant practice group. And that's important to understand because at the end of 10 weeks of, of practice, they were both given a test on a three foot target. Now, as I'm sure you can probably guess from the title of this video and what I'm talking about, the kids in the variable practice, the ones who just had the two foot and four foot target, they did better on precision than the kids who were given the three foot target, which is pretty amazing. So why, why does this work? Well, first of all, there are some important nuances to variable practice, which I'll talk about later. But for now, let's look at a couple of possible reasons for this result. One reason that variable practice works well could be because when we use variable practice, we're, we're using more of an external focus of attention, like focusing on the target or, or the goal, rather than an internal focus of attention, like you know how our fingers are moving or how the arm is moving, et cetera, things like that. And research has consistently shown that having an external focus or focusing on the goal enhances our motor skill learning better and faster than having an internal focus of attention. So that's one reason. Another reason could be that, uh, that varying the way we work on a skill also obligates us to increase our attention in general. And of course, there's a mountain of research out there showing that increased attention improves the learning process. So the more, we're, the more concentrated we are, the more focused we are on a particular task, then generally speaking, the faster we're gonna learn it and then the better we're gonna be able to retain that information long-term. Now, a third reason could be that the variations themselves give our brains a more kind of a more robust or more complete representation of the skill that we're developing, which seems to help us lock it into long term memory even more. You know, the way I think about that last one is kind of like if you learn, uh, learn a language and you learn the, the vowels of a language, like, for example, if you're learning English, the sound a has that sound a. But if you think of the sound a from the word and it's a right and if you think of the sound, the letter a in the word all it's all right so they're all right there there are three sounds but understanding those variations gives us a better understanding not only of the letter a and its possible sounds but of the language in its entirety whenever the the letter a is used so it seems to make quite a bit of sense to me if you've ever felt like no matter how much you repeat something it just doesn't stick one possible reason could be that you may be using too much constant practice and not enough variable practice. Now, the general consensus in the research is that even though constant practice it can give us immediate results, I'm sure you've seen it, if you practice something, you can get better right away in the practice room. It does seem like our brains just really aren't very good at holding on to that constant practice skill for very long, which means that if we, if we decide to just use constant practice exclusively, we would really need to practice the same phrase the same way all the time just to try to curb our rate of forgetting. And then, well, if we miss a couple practice sessions or 
maybe if something about how we perform changes, then that constant practice skill might not hold very well. And if we're going to play music for anybody or even for our own enjoyment, we definitely want those skills to hold long term. And I think more importantly, we want to be able to execute those correctly on the first try, because in performance, that's all we get. Which leads me to another really interesting basketball study that author and professor Molly Gabrion mentions in her new book, uh, which is all about the neuroscience of music, uh, neuroscience of practicing, which by the way, I, it's an awesome book. I just got my book, I'm about halfway through it, and it's just absolutely amazing. It's really well written. So I think if you like this kind of thing, you should absolutely get the book. I will have a link to that in the description below. Anyway, that study on the basketball shooting found that the people who practiced with variability did better on their first attempt in a later test or performance scenario compared to people who didn't use variable practice. So hopefully just that result alone will convince you to add variable practice to your bag of tricks. Now, since that famous beanbag study I mentioned earlier came out, there have been plenty of follow-up studies and really the majority support the idea that variable practice is, is really the way to go for long-term retention of an improved skill. But there is a growing body of research suggesting that the application of variable practice is a lot more nuanced and that its success has a lot to do with other factors, like for example, um, like how well we understand the skill to begin with, uh, how our level of expertise, you know, if we're a beginner or a pro when we, when we um, try that skill, and even how difficult the variations are in each repetition. There was a really interesting study done by Caballero et al. that was recently published, actually it was published in June 2024, and in that study the author suggests that the difficulty level you add to your variable practice is a significant factor to consider for long-term improvement. In this study the researchers had uh, participants throw tennis balls underhand, similar to the beanbag study, but they adjusted the difficulty level for each variability. So, for example, group one threw the tennis balls, but they, they varied the way they threw it at a low variability so that the variability was it's not too hard, just maybe a little outside the comfort zone. And then they had another group throw with about a medium variability, so a little harder. And then the third group had a high variability, which was the most challenging. And what the researchers essentially found was that the difficulty of variability really needs to be adjusted to the performer's current level in order to get the best results, like, which makes total sense to me, right? I mean, for example, you don't want to give a beginner a really difficult variation and just like you wouldn't want to give a pro something super easy. That's not going to really work for anybody. My takeaway from all of this is that whenever we vary a repetition, the difficulties of the next repetitions should really just be slightly outside of your comfort zone. Too little is no, no improvement and too much is also no improvement. In fact, if, if it's too difficult, you may even get worse because you're going to make too many errors. Now there are a few really important things that I found in the research on variable practice that I think we need to be very careful about. So to begin with, before we even start to use variable practice, we first need to use constant practice when we're initially learning a new skill. And we need to do that so that we can get the new skill to a stable sort of baseline level where we can perform that skill slowly and correctly. And depending on your level, that could be you know maybe just a handful of repetitions. Or if you're a total beginner or you're early on in your, in your practice, that could be maybe a handful of practice sessions. It doesn't matter. The point is you need to do a small number, whatever that is relative to, to your level, a small number of constant uh, practice repetitions in order to get to your baseline. And then once you reach the baseline, then you can start incorporating variable practice to help improve and retain your skill long term. Another thing to consider is that when we start using variable practice, we are inevitably going to start making mistakes, which means that we then need to go back to constant practice to correct the mistakes. And then once corrected at a, well, what I think is an acceptable success rate, then we can add variable practice back into our strategies again. And then we keep doing that sort of toggling, toggling back and forth until we reach our desired goal long term. The, the bottom line is that variable practice is it just it's not going to work on its own. We need to also make sure that we're, we're using other strategic practice methods along the way. The last important thing to consider is that when we use variable practice, the variations should really be related to the skill that we're working on as, as much as possible. Right. So if we're working on a musical phrase where we have a bunch of 16th notes and we're in the phrase calls for 200 beats per minute, quarter note, 200 beats per minute then we want to vary our tempo uh, a little bit and our rhythm a little bit, but, but not too much. Like for example, we don't want to start playing all the 16th notes as if they were half notes. It's going to be way too slow and that's probably not going to be very helpful to us. Some other things that we can vary in that same example are uh, your tone or your dynamics at the similar you know, tempo 200 beats per minute, because well, I mean, you probably want to do that anyway for a much more interesting musical expression of the phrase. 
Okay, so let's apply these principles, at least in a quick example, to some playing, right? I'm gonna play a quick little excerpt from a buleria. This is a flamenco style, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, it's a flamenco style called buleria, and the piece is a piece uh, by Moraito, and it's called Comparito Gabriel. In this example, I've already done a lot of constant practice in order to learn the phrase. And what I wanna show you is how to apply variable practice to try to add a little bit of challenge once the phrase feels a little bit comfortable. I'm gonna show you some examples using dynamic variability, so that's changes in volume, uh, tone variability, so I'm gonna change my, in this case, just my right hand position to produce brighter or darker tones on the guitar, and then I'm gonna change my tempo. So the phrase is relatively simple. It's about an, maybe an early intermediate-ish piece, and it goes like this. Right? The part I'm really interested in is this part. Right, it's just a simple PI, alternating rhythm. But I'm just going to focus on that part because the stuff before it that I played, I feel super comfortable with, and the ending, I feel very comfortable with. It's this part, which is, feels a little bit funny to me. Right, so that part. So first I'm going to use constant practice. Right, I'm going to repeat that. Made a mistake. Slow down. Constant practice, same tempo, same volume, same tone, everything is really the same, right? Now, as soon as that feels comfortable, that may take me maybe a handful of more repetitions in order for it to be totally comfortable at that tempo. Uh, let me do a couple more just to see if that, we can get that to happen. Feels better. Much better. So now let's add a little bit of variability in terms of dynamics, right? Now this could potentially cause errors. So let's try it. I'm gonna start quiet and I'm gonna end loudly. So I'm gonna do a crescendo. So it was kind of a little bit off rhythmically. So let's do that again. I'm gonna try, I made a, what I consider a slight mistake. So I'm gonna use that same variability, but I'm gonna practice it the same way. So. I've done variable practice, but I'm gonna use constant practice to reinforce the variable practice. I hope that makes sense. So let's try that again. So crescendo. Do that again. One more time. One more time. Okay. So I've worked on dynamics. Now, in practice, I might actually go the other way and go loud to quiet. I may do a bell curve, quiet, loud, quiet, an upside down bell curve, loud, quiet, loud, just to add in a few different variations of that. For now, I'm happy with the crescendo. I wanna move on to a different thing. Let's change my tone while I'm playing it. So I'm gonna start here. Actually, I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna, as I'm playing it, I'm gonna move down to a brighter sound as I get closer to those basses. So. You can hear the difference in tone, right? So, by the way, my, I'm keeping my volume the same, and tempo is back to what it was before. Okay. Made a mistake. I'm gonna isolate the mistake. To feel a little bit better so i might do a few more repetitions to make sure that that's cleaned up now let me change my tempo so i've done a dynamic variation i worked on tone variation where i went from uh, from darker sound to brighter sound so the last variability is going to be tempo variability now here i'm going to abandon the, the dynamic variability and i'm going to abandon the note the tone variability and i'm just going to focus on tempo so i'm going to keep my hand where it is i'm really not going to try to change my volume even though i might do that naturally at this point but my goal isn't to do that. My goal is just to change my tempo. So initial tempo. Let's try a little faster. 
that didn't go so well. So I'm gonna try to fix that at that same new tempo. All right, the reason it didn't go well is because I have a little tension in my hand. That's better. That's good too. Let me try to slow it down a little bit more. I made a mistake. Mistake again. So when I make two mistakes, I like to slow down quite a bit. Again, I'm back to constant practice now, right? See if I can increase the tempo, that's starting to feel better again. All right, that's feeling way better. Now again, I'm not necessarily looking for immediate results. If I get them, that's great, but I'm looking for more long-term results. So I'm gonna apply this same principle next time, the same ideas, next time I sit down to practice this phrase. That could be tomorrow, it could be the next day. Usually, I personally, I like to alternate days uh, on material that I'm a little more comfortable with. But it doesn't matter, you can do it every day. And then the next day, same idea, right? And over time, this is gonna solidify better. All my corrections are gonna, are gonna get a lot more stabilized and I'll be able to execute this, hopefully on the first try, at least that's the idea, when I perform it. So just for fun, let's add in some rhythm, a little compas, and see if we can make this phrase work, see what happens. <laughs> Not bad, it's still, I still have a lot of work to do on that, but it's feeling a little bit better. So next time I practice, I'll go to the same methods, I might end with the same compas thing, and so forth and so on, right? I might even use this compas, uh, this, this rhythm, as my metronome and adjust the speeds. That could be my metronome instead of having a click, I could use this, it doesn't matter. The idea is, again, I'm varying my tempo, my, my tone, and my dynamics for this. Now, aside from the examples I showed you, you can also try varying other things like rhythm, uh, like adding embellishments, varying your articulation. So if you're playing guitar, it could be slurs, for example, or playing staccato or playing legato. Uh, you can even try varying non-musical things, like, for example, changing, changing the wall that you're facing when you practice. Doing something like that is gonna give you a different sound and you may adjust your playing accordingly. You can also make slight adjustments to your posture. All of those things are totally valid and, and I think they could definitely help us improve more. At the very least, by simulating some kind of change that we may inevitably experience when we play for people in different settings. Now, in terms of music performance, to me, it just makes sense to use variable practice in general because musical expression as a whole isn't really constant, or at least it shouldn't be, I don't think. In a good performance, we hear changes all the time, right? We hear people changing their tempos, or we hear, change, hear, hear people changing their dynamics, like their volumes, their tones, their rhythms, their articulations, etc. Uh, music or, or good music really isn't one dimensional so I think that if we want to play with the same freedom and expression that our favorite artists have then we need to practice in a multi-dimensional manner as well in other words we need to use variable practice instead of using constant practice all the time or we repeat in the same manner now variable practice is, is awesome I use it all the time and it's really an excellent strategy that can definitely help us improve but combining it with other strategies like deliberate practice or strategic success rates, those can take our playing to an even higher level. So if you want to learn more about how to do that and how to apply them to your practice, make sure to check out the next video on the screen now where I break down those exact techniques for you. Thanks and see you over there.